Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now, historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show NOE talk preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not, as at Bikini, to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. My name is Kat Hobson. I am your host. And we have got such a great show coming up. I'm excited by this. I have someone joining me who is not, not really given to doing a lot of interviews of late and I'm so fortunate you're going to love him he's one of the most eclectic people that I have ever researched much less spoke with and this is going to be a lot of fun you will know him as Walt Christos he is an author he is a metaphysician he is a spiritualist a humanist and it's really interesting because he has such diversity in his studies. His background covers just about an exposure to every religion that one could imagine. He has, he's just done a great job with his life and he believes in helping others. He believes in sharing with others. He believes in educating others and so, Walt Christos, hello there. Thank you for joining me tonight. 
And thank you for having me, and what a lovely introduction. Oh, thanks. I worked on that all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, did a, you did a fine job, and I thank you. Well, you're welcome. It's all true, and you know it, so pretty cool. And yeah, I have am, a long history. You do have a long history, and you have a pretty interesting history as well. You have... You have been in a lot of, of the places that I hold very dear to my heart. And one of them I'm going to be in next week. I'll be doing my Halloween show live from the cemetery in Key West. And you lived there for quite some time and in that area. So, yes, I did. And I also had a uh, feature column for four or five years in the Key West Citizen. Mm-hmm. I did world news independently. I had, had a feature called World Press Watch. And I reviewed about 150 publications from all over the world. And I tried to find items that related to what major media was focusing on, but which had not yet been reported. And in general, I managed to stay about six weeks ahead. And some people might like to say that was because I'm a psychic. But I think that some of it was smart, too. But, yeah, Key West is a a jewel in the sea. Yes, and it is. I lived there for about three years. And, you know, you're hitting it in a during its cooler weather. But that means you might have to be in the 80s or maybe even low 70s. And the people there will be wearing sweaters. <laughs> Absolutely. I was there um, about five years ago. I go every year. And, of course, last year I had to come home early. But um, I go every year. And there was one night that most of my roommates there are from points farther north. Than I am, so they bring jeans and hoodies and stuff to wear home. Well, mm-hmm. I did not because I'm from Alabama, oh, <laughs> and yeah, I did no, not have anything me. warm. I stayed in the house that night, so which was not a hardship because we just had people no, over. You, you can feel the cool in Florida mm-hmm. because of the humidity. Yes. It brings cold moisture through your clothing, through cloth at least. You have to wear something like a vinyl to yes. keep that keeps the outer air out. And you don't well, expect it, and that's what catches you by surprise. The temperature might not be as low as in other places, but it feels just as cold. Absolutely. And I'm fortunate because I hang out on the Gulf Coast a lot. So it was, you know, I'm I'm used to humidity. <laughs> I'm used to mm-hmm. lots of humidity. But they were not. So it was very surprising to them. You know, I've been there in a monsoon. I've been there when I had to have lots of clothes. And I've been there where you could not get enough clothes off because it was illegal. It was so hot. So, <laughs> yeah, the, there are places where the men aren't allowed to take their shirts off, mm-hmm. which I think is kind of absurd. But uh, you know, <laughs> well, what took you to Key West? Ah, uh, I was traveling around, and I had always, when I was a kid, my family used to go to the Keys to fish. And uh, I had thought that I might want to live there. And I ended up in Alabama, okay? In Clanton in Clinton, or Clinton in Clanton, I don't remember now, but it's about 60 miles south of Birmingham. Clanton, On a blueberry yes, farm in, in winter. <laughs> okay. Oh, and it was that was a mistake. And all we had is an outdoor... <laughs> outhouse and I froze to death and I got tired of it and I got in my beaten up car with one basket of dirty laundry and about $40 and I went to West. (laughs) 
You know, that's actually how a lot of people wind up there. Truly. They just, they're fed up with where they are. They load their car and they're out of there. And they get to the keys. And back then it was a lot easier to find a way to make it work. But um, the keys, when I was there, was 1977 to 1981. And they were in a economic low. And so everything was very reasonable. And there were hostels, which yes. is a place where you can rent a bunk. And there's a, a shower and that kind of stuff. And it was pretty good. But I went there. I walked out onto a pier. And this girl sat down next to me. And uh, she had a husband and a child. And I ended up staying with him, got a job, got a place of my own. You know. <laughs> Pretty cool. It just worked out. Yeah. Well, you know, things do, right? It's just, and it's what well, I believe is what you believe as well, that you have your own path and you're guided through this. It's not like you're just, or you should not be wandering around like a loose cannon. There's a little bit of both, perhaps. I believe yeah. that we have influence. And one of the psychic things for me as a youth was manifestations of things that I wanted or said. And I, I phrase it that way because sometimes people just casually say things. But with me, they would then occur. And it got worse as I was becoming a teenager in that things people said around me could also then occur to them. Okay? And so going back to what you were saying in we are guided. I think that is true, but it's not the only influence. It's just one of many in the great swirl of life. So basically, intent to manifest. Or even, I've, I've seen it happen not intending. But, Correct. Which is sometimes a bit of a shock. I had, mm-hmm. I had great energy. It's what I call automatic flow of will and it's a little bit separate than the life force energy that a healer might use though I was capable of using that as well but I'm just saying there's there are differences one is say flowing from the mind and the other is either from the body or the spirit and uh, let me rephrase that and say I believe one is mostly from the mind, psychic things, and I believe that healing energies can come from the body or the spirit. Because that's a true statement, but it's my opinion. Right. I don't want to cast anything as concrete fact. But I believe that there can be other ways for healing, other ways for psychic and this and that. But for me... That's how it worked. And uh, so that was going on in my life as well. So maybe I was guided, but I mean, if I was to get there, uh, they certainly took me in the opposite direction by landing me in Alabama. (laughs) Well, it was just a byway on your highway. Because it took me getting. It took me getting super fed up of the cold and the situation and the, just being so totally stuck in the middle of nowhere with nothing. And it was a dry county, and we could go play pinball and pool in one place. Oh, my. <laughs> and, Clanton is still yeah, a rather a, small community. It was a big change from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where <laughs> everything was flowing everywhere, you know? I do. It was, So then I went to Key West, and maybe that was, maybe my meeting that particular girl 
was guided to get me to stay. Right? Because Key West became a very good spot for me to be because from it, I could touch people and interact with people from all over the world. That's true. And which would have been a guided thing. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's still a place like that. You know, it's it's very eclectic. Yeah. People think it's crazy. It's not. They have um you may have to be a little different to be able to find your spot, but it's it's a great place. And you actually um There are there are reasonable places around there. When I was there it was in the process of becoming more expensive. Mm-hmm towards the tail end of my being there. And uh, the workers were starting to move to the next islands, and then you'd have to commute in. Yes, But I do. lived by the airport. And uh, you couldn't, there's no direct road to the airport except along the outside of the island. But I lived on the interior of the island in old naval barracks. And many of them have now been torn down for duplexes and more modern housing. But back then, more modern housing was not necessarily desired mm -hmm. because the people didn't want the congestion and... We didn't have the electricity or the water. Absolutely. The water, the water is still water an came issue. In from the pipe. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, there was a desal plant somewhere, but most of the water came in by pipeline from Miami. Well, I'm going to go on record as telling you I'm so glad that you were protecting that island because now. Yeah. You have to go and light candles, yeah. and it still works. But you did that for, what was it? 30 years, and they still have they still have my protection. Yes. I say, okay, I am amongst the many things that I am. I am a traditional weather-oriented Iroquois shaman. Or I am an Iroquois who is a shaman who is traditionally weather-oriented. And I believe that a person's... There's many ways this works, okay? But one of the things that motivated me to issue my protection pledge to media was that the media there had reported a psychic there as saying that Key West would that coming year be hit and devastated by oh. a hurricane. Mm -hmm. I remember that. All right. Now, since you've been to Key West, you know the high ground is, what, Solaris Hill, and it's six feet above sea level. And it's one area that is six feet above sea level. Most everything is at sea level with, you know, maybe three feet, two feet above here and there. And if you get, and Key West is a peanut-shaped island. It is four miles by two miles, right? So whenever you get a storm surge that hits a major coast, line, what you can anticipate is 20-foot waves or a 10-foot storm surge coming a mile inland. Uh, I mean, so the long story short is there's no natural barrier, no natural wind breaks anywhere but open seas on all sides. Yep. And there's, they would be wiped out, basically. And when I was there, the housing was so, let's say it was wood and not concrete. 
<laughs> most everything would fly away, okay? So I believe that as that each individual has an automatic influence of flow of will according to what they believe. Okay? Now, a sorcerer oh, is someone who will have stand to, in a group. I have to stop you. Pardon? I have to stop you. All right. We're at our uh, break, uh, but we will be right back, and we are going to pick right back up where we left off with sorcerer. Alright. Y'all just come right back. All right. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. To the believer. The evidence is overwhelming. To the skeptic, there will never be enough. Hello everyone. Join Kevin and Jennifer Malik, the host of Paraversal Universe, every Friday here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCET-FM and The Rift. Log on or tune in as they check out the mysteries found within the eight categories of the unknown and unexplained including ghosts and haunted places, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, cryptids and monsters, urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, metaphysics, and forbidden archaeology. Listen as Kevin and Jennifer interview the top minds in their respective fields as they share theories and information regarding these unsolved mysteries. For future show and archive information, one can find Paraversal Universe on Facebook, Twitter, and MeWe under various Paraversal Universe headings. So, for excellent talk radio about the unknown and unexplained, check out Paraversal Universe, where all paranormal perspectives apply. Brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society, LTV, and produced by WBHMDB.com. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, with my guest, Walt Christos. And we were discussing the different things that he has done in his life we're just getting started i was about to go off on a, a tangent about as people believe so goes their flow of will and a sorcerer can be someone who tries to claim that energy and that he'll get in front of a group and he'll say i can do this and the people will believe that he can do that and right. because the people believe that he can do it, he then does it, but he's using their energy to do it. But they don't know that because they don't believe in themselves, but they believe in him. So they send the energy of their belief to him, and he gets a manifestation, which he then claims. And it's trickery, and that's sorcery or conjuring. Yes. And I'd been saying that the psychic in Key West had predicted uh, through media that Key West would be devastated. And when media 
says something is going to occur in the weather. It yeah. is conjuring. And that's what I say our meteorologists do a lot of the time, is they forecast what the weather will be. Then their group, their audience, believes it. And because that group believes what that forecaster has said, then their influence goes to make that forecast manifest. And that is conjuring. So, whenever people in Florida or in a hurricane area are hit with this terrific media hype that you are about to die and everything you own is going to be destroyed, just jump in your car and flee, all right? That conjuring, the hype is well-intended, let us hope, to get people to take proper precautions. But it's like crying wolf, and after they've done it a number of times, people don't necessarily listen. But there is the psychic effect. So, to counterbalance that psychic effect of the predictions of gloom, doom, and disaster, I stepped forward and said that I would seek to use my ability to influence weather to protect Key West, and then I expanded to call them Area Kokomo, from being hit with the eye of a hurricane. And if nothing else, my stepping forth and being reported by media helped to break that absolute certainty of disaster by the public focus of will. you follow that? Well, I do follow that. And, you know, it's kind of become almost a joke along the coastline from Texas to the Keys all the way through that, you know, if Jim Cantore shows up in your town, you might as well hang yep. it up. Yeah, you're yeah. right. I've heard yeah. that. We call him the angel of disaster. And yeah. it's true. Well, I've said they should send me to where he is, and we'll see what happens. But I would agree. You know, I had a young friend who was... Would have, it would have been a really good experiment when I was between 20 and 50. Okay, yeah. but I am not as great and powerful, and a lot of my energies are perhaps focused on my own health. Right. But I still, I'm still probably more powerful than some, greater than others, in my own way, kind of thing. You know. I do know. Uh, at any rate, it got me to start issuing this hurricane protection pledge because. Stan Windhorn, of all names, reported it. And uh, so then I reissued it next year. And he reported it again. And so then I started issuing the pledge. Now, originally, Kokomo was from Key West up to Savannah. And over to Atlanta and then down through Gainesville and through the center of the state to Tampa and then down to Lauderdale, sorry, down to Naples, then across from Naples to Lauderdale and then back to Key West. So it was a big area. And I did get requests to end droughts or to bring rain or to protect this event or do that. And it consumed some of my time and focus because I had to be looking at what was happening. I never magically make something happen out of nothing. I am aware of the science of meteorology. And so, therefore, depending upon what is desired, I vector as is said in math, in that you plot a course based on the currents 
in the winds and whatever, and you adjust to get to where you want to go. And I do the same thing, working from natural conditions to a desired result. And what I would do would depend on what the natural conditions were and what the desired result was. So I gave myself a break in later years because there was a shaman to my north who called himself Gondolf. I didn't name him. He named himself. And he took from Jacksonville through Tallahassee to uh, a little bit north of Tampa and then back across, say, around Orlando and back up to Jacksonville. So he had that center portion. And so Kokomo, for 30 years in media, was from uh, Key West up the east coast of Florida to Foreman Beach, which is just north of Daytona. Then across I-4 from Daytona through Orlando to Tampa. And then south, uh, trying to think if it's I-75 over there, but on the west coast down to Naples, then across on what used to be Alligator Alley, but I believe is now I-75 to Lauderdale and then back to Key West. That will always be Alligator Alley? Yeah, to me. You know, it's Cape Canaveral, but it's a, it's a native thing. If you've been there. But I guess people who are born with the new names accept them as well, and that's fine. Now, I said that I could protect or influence the weather of any place that I had been because I could accurately touch it. Okay, as as long as I could have an accurate memory of it in my mind, which means until the place changes so that it differs from my memory or my memory of it fades. So I can touch it in my own mind. It's much, I believe, it is much more challenging to protect an area than it is to touch any spot on the globe, which is something I could possibly do using what I would call secondary methods. But my own example has been to do what I can do as an individual human, as an example for other individual humans without use of rituals, objects, incantations, or magic of any sort. I have nothing against use of objects, rituals, incantations, or magic per se. Uh, I prefer that they be used in ways that are helpful to others but I have avoided them to demonstrate what can be done as a human individual without use of crutches. I have tried to show people they can walk on their own two feet because when people learn to use tools, which is fine, they often fail to learn to do things on their own, which I believe people can learn to do. So do you feel that um, using those crutches, as we were talking about earlier with the conjurer or sorcerer, that do you not feel... Well, in that respect, the conjurer is a crutch. The conjurer is, yes. 
but the people don't know it. Whereas if you were using a, maybe it's the same thing. If you have a, a candle and you believe the candle allows you to focus your good energy and as it glows, so goes your energy and love is in the air, whatever. If it's green, it's good for this. If it's black, it's good for that. And you don't even have to watch it. Just light it, walk away. And it's good as long as it's burning. What I'm saying is that a person can do the same thing without the candle as with the candle. But they believe in the candle but they don't believe in themselves. Gotcha. And you're right. That is an absolute fact. Both both have validity because objects, rituals, and incantations, I view them as karmically neutral and that it is their use which produces positive or negative karma. But... Something that is repeatedly used through time can become imbued with residual energy. And people can use that residual energy. So a tool can be used even by an empowered individual. Okay, But what can happen to someone who's learning is that they'll believe in the candle, they won't believe in themselves, and they won't learn to develop their own ability. Well, it, It's one of the pitfalls. In the American injury tradition, it's anything that helps you is an ally. But don't let your allies become crutches. A crutch is good when you can't walk on your own two feet, but you're going to have to try to walk on your own two feet so that then you can discard use of the crutch. But if you only crutches walk on crutches grow comfortable, crutches, though. Mm-hmm, it can be. I'm just, as a metaphysician, I have sought to teach people how to cope with internal and external negativity in positive ways and how to learn to develop their own psychic abilities if they have any, okay? And so I guess I am a proponent of individual human empowerment. Well, let me ask you, because we have a question, we have a couple of questions in the chat room relevant to this. And um, one of them is, I don't know if you're going to have an answer for this, but we're going to see. Um, How many people do you believe are true sorcerers or conjurers that truly, that truly exist? And are most of them good or bad, or do you believe some of them use their abilities for evil? Uh, Mixed bag. I believe many exist. The thing with a sorcerer or a conjurer is that person knows that he is tricking other people to gain the use of their will. Okay. okay. That's what makes it a sorcerer or a conjurer, male or female. Right? You might say there was a word magicians in the old way, not the mentalist or the uh, stage magician, you know, not that kind of magic, but a real magician would use objects, rituals, and incantations, and maybe some of them are called witches, okay? 
I mean, words can have many meanings, okay? That's true. And I would say that there are very many who are genuine. And that as far as how many try to do harm and how many try to do good, I think they will tell you themselves. I think they will give you their own warning label about that. One thing I've always laughed is that when a person tells you what they've done to someone else because that someone else deserved it, you should realize that one day you could be that someone else. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, the greatest warning label on people today is tattoos. I mean, are they covered with knives, skulls? <laughs> or <laughs> butterflies artifacts, and trees. Right? Yeah. Know? Or butterflies, dragons, trees. I mean, these are warning labels, okay? Now, it's true people are capable of change. But I have found that change can be slow to come and that most people stay as they are until forced to change. And I would until agree with that. they tell you they are going to try to change, it's the repent and go and sin no more thing. Until they tell you that they know what they did was wrong and that they won't do it anymore, then don't assume they've changed because they've not indicated it. All right. Well, sometimes you have to let them know what their ante is too. If they are trying to do something to harm you or someone else that you care about. But Sherry wanted to know, do you believe that such people can actually conjure up devastating weather? And also, she would like to know what's the difference between sorcerers, conjurers, and wizards. And are there even wizards out there? Uh, Is it semantics? Let's just say that word, yeah, words can have many different meanings. In the way that I just used it, I'd say wizards are magicians. It can be an interchangeable term for me. Mm -hmm. And that saucers or conjurers can be an inter interchangeable term for me. And that a saucer or a conjurer is basically using other people's wills. Uh, where a uh, magician or a wizard is using the imbued energies, the imbued residual energies of things, or as a group, like say there's a coven, and they all decide to put their energy to something. That is knowingly doing it. Now, there used to be a complaint against Wicca, perhaps from Christians. But the complaint was that most people seeking power, uh, which the Wiccans are prone to be involved with, are seeking it to have power over others. They're, they want it for revenge. They want someone to love them. They want money. They want So they're inflicting their will on others. So to some degree... People used to, in the past, generalize that the people who were seeking power were not normally of good intent. It's, uh, I have to stop you because we're late for our break, and I apologize. I don't know your mid-thought, but... We will be right back because now we've got more questions coming. So everyone, just bear with us. We will get Walt right back and get these answers for you. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Hey. 
Abnormal Alabama presents Crypticon, October 25th and 26th, at the Board in the Wharf, Orange Beach. Bigfoot, the paranormal, authors and speakers, vendors, and your chance to experience the Psychomantium. There'll be a costume contest and much, much more. October 25th and 26th at the Board in the Wharf, Orange Beach. Get more info, directions, and tickets available now at abnormalalabama.com. That's abnormalalabama.com. <laughs> How about this? For some real information that you can use, instead of the other um, sources, stay here where you are on WBHM DB, Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. We are so, <clears throat> excuse me, so glad you're here. And I'm joined by Walt Christos. So, yes, I know this is so cool. But we were discussing um, intent, the different the differences between sorcerers, conjurers, and wizards, and you had moved into people who were seeking power for themselves. Yeah, it was just that uh, the, the question, the initial question, there was one other part of that question, which was, do I believe people can do things. use either their own energies or magic or whatever to help influence for bad weather? And yeah, I do. I do. Uh, it I is, agree. When a person is learning about things, it tends to be what happens accidentally that shows them what they could learn to do deliberately. And often the things that happen accidentally are those that occur with heightened emotion, anger, joy, happiness, sex, whatever, <laughs> but strong energy. And so most people have that kind of strong energy when they are angry. And if they have a connection or a predilection for weather, then their influence will tend to manifest more in a harmful way than in a beneficial way. But when you're watching a weather report or you hear someone say something terrible, that's your opportunity to vote against it. Because if you just let it ride, then it's flowed through you towards its manifestation. You haven't blocked ah. it. You did not put your own intent up against it. Correct. And you can. I believe will flows through four gears. All right? And that is disbelief, which is an active belief against something. I disbelieve that. So you're actually using your will to block it, right? I disbelieve that this person's a psychic. So then you're using your will to uh, block that person, okay? Then there is doubt, and that is, I don't know, but I think it isn't. And that's still kind of closing the door, mm -hmm. right? Then there's faith. And faith is, I don't know, but it could be so. 
and that opens the door. <laughs> and then there's belief, which is, I believe this is so. And that's when your will will flow, right? And will can flow automatically, naturally, unconsciously, or manually by conscious choice and design. For me, as an empowered individual, I believe my will flows according to my belief. It is an influence among influences, okay? Right. So, when people are sitting back and watching the weather report on TV, okay, more often than not, they'll believe it. Not necessarily always, and sometimes then their will goes against it, but that's your vote. And the same holds true with everything that you experience in life. For me, as a youth, they said I gained manifestation not only of things that I would say casually, without meaning, without even wanting them to. I was just that gifted. And uh, one of the things I did eventually was I hooked. There came a point where I lost my doubt. I have a very unique and left field story, but part of it was that I lost my doubt in who I am and what I can do. And when I hit that point, I would say the doors to all realms were open to me and that my will really manifested hard. So, I mean, things really, really, really happened around me. And uh, so I connected to weather. Okay? And that then became the recipient of my automatic bounce, as I called it. All right? Bounce is something hits you and then goes away from you, and that's the bounce. And that's when you watch the weather report and it says something, and you say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to dress for that. That's your bounce. You've just agreed to that weather. Your will is now flowing for it, whether you know it or not, because that's how it naturally flows, okay? And that is bounce. And so I connected to weather. And by doing that, I believe I reduced the bounce on, on people around me which was a good thing. <laughs> that is a good thing. It was more punishing for people than it was beneficial often because that's how people casually can be. And I well, used to joke that I was a manifestation of karma incarnate. <laughs> Admit, you know, it was really not... Uh, I couldn't get people to respect karma, but I could get them to fear it. <laughs> That's funny. And that was sad. That's not what I intended to teach. And so I had to counterbalance myself. Well, you know, we often have unintended. Been, yeah. You have to manually act to stop your automatic sometimes. And sometimes you can reach out. I remember in one of my great moments of anger, I just said peace, right? And sent my energy into the universe for peace, right? And all that fury. And just said, well, let's put that towards working for peace. <laughs> right? Yeah. I could have well, channeled it in a harmful way. But I chose to channel it in a positive way. Well. And when you're caught up in it, you don't necessarily think about it. And that still can be sometimes true for me. I mean, I tell people, act not in anger. All right? Whether you're disciplining a child, a pet, or dealing with your friends, wait till you have cooled off and then address the situation. Because 
Otherwise, all you're liable to communicate is your anger. And you are angry because you care. And so, therefore, what you are angry at is something you care about. And the last thing you should do is inflict anger on something you care about. Yes. Now, it's a, that's a tough one. It's something people aren't necessarily aware of. But once you're aware of it, you have a chance of restraining yourself. You know, like I ask myself, I say, is this going to be important in three months? There you go. And if the answer is no, then it's not important now. Minus two so, weeks. You know? That's my, you know, I always ask myself, is this going to matter in two weeks? Because I should I probably back away three months or back down. By then they've forgotten they did it and I, I can get them. <laughs> Oh, you're so funny. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's to walk a mile in their shoes, you know, so that then if they're angry, you know, you're a mile away and you have their <laughs> shoes. <laughs> that has always been one of my favorite things. So, well, Sherry said you can move near her so that she can always have 70 degree sunny days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I freeze when it's 70. I give her a good bounce on that. <laughs> and I go through Virginia. I'm in Virginia now. Yep. And, uh, She's in northern Alabama. Yeah. So. I haven't been that before. I haven't been north of Birmingham in Alabama, but it certainly was cold enough for me there. But at the time, I was a Florida boy, and... I was a South Florida boy, okay? And, and there's what a difference. That means is that Orlando is up north. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I mean, you know, Jacksonville is cold country. <laughs> well, so, Gulf Shores uh, had frozen, had snow and had frozen tidal pools. That is too yeah. far north. And I love Gulf Shores. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, we've only got about two and a half minutes before our top of the hour break. And she has more questions. So probably right. we're going to um, come back. But one of these, she's heard that there are different types of witches out there. She's heard of white witches, but do you seriously believe they can do things to people or even harm them? Yeah. Yeah. But I most do too. People I've, I've experienced that. White witches don't want to harm they might be protective, but they're not going to be aggressive. And Wiccans, okay, there are many different people who call themselves witches, and they can be of all different persuasions, from Satanist to Christian to Wiccan to Gardnerian Wiccan, you know used to be that just being psychic meant you would be called a witch, and that, you know, I know atheists who are psychic, so they wouldn't even want to be part of that. So, no, people are people as individuals. Yes. Right? Witches are just as diverse as Christians. People are born into spots. And sometimes whatever it is, they are that in name only. Okay? It's the choices people make as an adult that more clearly define who they wish to be. Yes. And, you know, a lot of that is just, like you said, you're born into it. You, Or your family moves and you wind up in a different church yeah, or a different I'd, type. You know, there's all yeah. kinds of things that can affect that. As people are born into Republican families. They're born into uh, being Christian. They're born into being a Southerner. They're born into being black. They're born into being a... California Hollywood celebrity kid. They're born into rich and powerful families. 
they're you know they're born on a farm they're supposed to stay there so no these people are born in there are gay Muslims all right I mean these are gay people who were born as Muslims and they are devout as Muslims and they are gay and that can be a real tightrope but that that's what be. they were born into yeah that's what they were born into you know, I watched a good friend of mine praying to a statue of Buddha. I thought Buddha would be horrified. Buddha <laughs> would be horrified. And on that <laughs> note, we are at the well, top of the hour. Good. So that is funny, though. But um, we will be right back. You know, this is a news break, so maybe, maybe we'll find something good out there. One can always hope, right? So... Mm -hmm. Enjoy this. This is a good time to fill up your you know, coffee mug or beer mug or wine glass or tea glass. Or just stretch your legs, throw a few cartwheels, as Brian D. Parsons used to say. And we will be right back. Thanks for being here, and y'all come back too. This message comes from NPR sponsor Old Edwards Inn and Spa in downtown Highlands, North Carolina. Savor the holiday season with the comfort and joy spa and dinner package for two. Visit oldedwardsinn.com to plan your holidays in Highlands. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Barbara Klein. The Trump administration says U.S. troops leaving northern Syria are being redeployed to western Iraq. NPR's Bobby Allen reports Defense Secretary Mark Esper says the American forces will be carrying out an anti-ISIS mission, contrary to the president's earlier statements. President Trump has repeatedly said that one of the reasons U.S. troops were being pulled out of northern Syria abruptly was to bring the soldiers back home. But speaking to reporters, Defense Secretary Mark Esper says the plan now is to redeploy the thousand troops leaving Syria to western Iraq. He says they will have a dual purpose. One is to help defend Iraq and two is to perform a counter ISIS mission as we sort through the next steps. And again, that's the current game plan. Things could change between now and whenever we complete the withdrawal. Despite the U.S. and Turkey saying a ceasefire was in effect, bombing along the Syrian border has not ended, and reports of civilian casualties keep mounting. Bobby Allen, NPR News. Esper is in Afghanistan, arriving today on an unannounced visit. He's due to explore restarting talks with the Taliban that President Trump declared dead and pulling out some U.S. forces from Afghanistan. Three U.S. soldiers were killed today in a training accident at an army base in Georgia. Three others are injured. Georgia Public Broadcasting's Emily Jones reports. The accident happened at Fort Stewart near Savannah, Georgia. The Bradley fighting vehicle the soldiers were in was involved in a training accident, according to a statement from the 3rd Infantry Division. Three were pronounced dead at the scene. Three others were taken to an Army hospital. Their names and further details about what happened have not been released. The incident is under investigation. The commanding general of the division called it a heartbreaking day and said our hearts and prayers go out to the families of those involved. For NPR News, I'm Emily Jones in Savannah. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he still plans for the U.K. to leave the European Union by the end of the month, though he's been forced to ask for a delay. Vicky Barker reports from London. Even some of his closest colleagues suspect Boris Johnson secretly wants Britain to crash out of Europe without a deal on October 31st. He's already said he'd rather be dead in a ditch than ask for another extension. That's why lawmakers passed an act requiring Johnson to request that extension if there was no new Brexit deal approved by yesterday. And why was there no new deal approved yesterday? Because even some MPs who support Johnson's new deal don't trust him to follow through on all its details. So they passed a second motion, insisting that final approval can only come after Parliament's had a chance to vote in every little detail. Johnson will make another attempt to get his new deal through Parliament tomorrow. For NPR News, I'm Vicki Barker in London. This is NPR. Crews in New Orleans have detonated controlled explosions to bring down two cranes. They were precariously and dangerously perched at the site of a hotel that partially collapsed last week while under construction. One crane is completely down, the other is not. 
Rioting continues in Santiago, Chile, even though Chile's president says he's suspending a fare hike on public transport that triggered the protests. Paige Sutherland reports the capital city is crippled. Damage estimates are up in the hundreds of millions from metro stations, city buses, stores and offices. Multiple fires were set across the city, resulting in dozens of injured. Much of the subway system went up in flames and remains closed. Officials say it could take months to fix. Schools in Santiago and the neighboring towns are canceled for the early part of this week. Riots were also reported throughout the entire country. The president is meeting with officials to figure out how to reverse the 4% fare hike that led to the chaos. But protesters say the transit hike was just the last straw. They're demanding more equality in health care, education, and salaries. For NPR News, I'm Paige Sutherland in Santiago. Deep sea researchers have found a Japanese aircraft carrier that went down in the Pacific during World War II's historic Battle of Midway, a turning point in the war. Scientists say they captured sonar images of the vessel today in deep waters halfway between the U.S. and Japan. I'm Barbara Klein, NPR News in Washington. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the Annie E. Casey Foundation, developing solutions to support strong families and communities to help ensure a brighter future for America's children. More information is available at AECF.org. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the second hour of Fate Mag Radio. I hope you enjoyed the first one as much as I did or even close because we have such a great guest. This is Walt Christos. We are having a great time conversing. He is the author of multiple books. He is a paranormal humanist. He's a spiritualist. He's very eclectic. He's an Iroquois shaman. He was educated in psychology. He is pretty, pretty amazing. He, one of the things that I wrote down because it just struck me as being totally Walt was Walt lives delving into realms of human belief and the nitty gritty aspects of the realms of human reality. And those are actually sometimes very different things. In my experience. So that's why that caught my eye, Walt. I thought that was a, a great statement yeah, about you. The realms, of, yeah, the realms of human belief and the nitty-gritty reality that we all live in. Part of it is that I teach people to seek to maintain their spiritual health while being competent and content in our real world. It's not always and easy, that is goes it? Back to, yeah. it's, it's, I have found that some realistic people disparage spirituality. And some people who are very big on spirituality, they disparage material world and I think that I at least have shown by my example that one can be competent in our real world and comfortable or content and maintain your spiritual health and spiritual priorities and I think many people actually do that but they said, uh, I have, when I was conducting a metaphysics forum by those of metaphysics, for those of metaphysics, and it was called a forum with no name, Yeah, I kept running into the enlightened who would preach love, 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 and heart, and you know, the uh, world is bad. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And some of that comes from Buddhism, 
which detaches from the material world, denies the material world. Buddha, Buddha lived as a hermit in the forest and counted mm-hmm. on other people to supply his needs, which is good for him, but it's not what I can in good conscience advise other people to do. Well, nice Lightning, work if you amen. can get it, though, right? Yeah. Some do. I mean, I know people that go by the highway and they they get 50 bucks a day. Yes. And they have regular feeders, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> wouldn't be caught dead working, you know. But I, I try to teach people to live through fair trade. Well, it's really the only way that one should. You know, you, you don't want to take advantage advantage predators do predators do but that's what yes but that's the definition of those characteristics very much in abundance they are very much in abundance Uh, i have never seen okay i'm not going to be critical (laughs) i laugh because i guess that I mean, I'm just about to go critical, right? Right. But our current generations for the past 15 years, maybe even 20 years, have gotten a great abundance of people who find it clever to live from government support. And they do it with mental disabilities of 1 to 12 or by being single mothers and getting pregnant at 18 and hooking into state support for 20 years, which then leaves them at, you know, at 40 with no work experience <laughs> and, and nothing to teach the kids. And the same people who are getting the mental disabilities for this and that instead of ever being taught how to cope without the drugs. And half the time, the drugs are causing the problem. Yes. And here's one that, okay, unnecessary use of a medication can cause the problem. The medication is supposed to prevent, cure, or inhibit. Anything you do that with any chemical you add to your system externally, your body will then lower its own production of. And usually this is concerning addictive recreational drugs like heroin or cocaine. Okay? Right. And when you, but it's true even of bodybuilding supplements. So when you get this external chemical into your system, your body's production of those elements is lowered. When you stop getting that external chemical, your body's production is lower than normal. It's not getting the external source, and that is why people have withdrawal. And the the withdrawal lasts until the body's own natural production rises back to normal levels. And that's clinical psychology, is that you can't teach them. They're broken robots. They don't want to learn. So you medicate them, right? And you fix their behavior with medications. This goes back to unnecessary use of a medication can cause the very problem the medication is meant to prevent. So you get a kid who might seem a little hyper and you sedate them, right, with medication instead of telling them, sit still, instead of teaching them to control themselves. They throw medicine at him, right? Yes. So he's sedated, he's sedated, he's sedated, he's sedated. And then you take him off that. And all of a sudden, he's got all this huge buildup of hyper energy, right? 
or the metabolism has just been hit so bad that the, he's just forever sluggish. But either way, they're claiming mental disabilities for it. Okay? And so today we've got a ton of that. The women are staying single. The men aren't even thinking of being fathers. There's no point in it because they're not going to get the kids. The people with the disabilities don't want to even try to work all right, because it might jeopardize their disability, you know. And uh, the men, for the most part, especially when the jobs were being shipped overseas, their welfare is going into the military. So you got all the young men going into into the military, which is their welfare system, and you got all the women having kids by themselves and raising them by themselves, and you know it's like a mess. But this was my rant in response to your saying that most people want to live through fair trade. And I'm telling you, no, they don't. They should. So many people think it is smart to be a parasite or a predator, to see what they can get or get over on. And, uh, you know, it's not good for your karma. It's not good for your wellness, and I would teach against it. But that is part of the picture of what's going on today. Though it's, I try to stay separate from social issues. I really do, and from political ones. And my focus on is on teaching people how to cope in positive ways with internal and external negativity and how to well, develop their own psychic abilities. And those goes, go hand in hand. Is, really? It does. And if I want to take one step back and tie this in, it's when I was saying that a lot of people, when they they see what they do accidentally, and a lot of that is with heightened emotions and they can be angry, what I teach is peace of being, a holistic alignment, a holistic, harmonious alignment of all the components of self. And then you can do all these things psychically, spiritually, without any emotion, either just by tapping it, thinking it, letting it go. And it really is that simple. And so that's what I do is I try to get people to where they're not angry, to where they have peace of being, where they have wellness, and get their energy flows to help maintain them or to help elevate their spirit because I believe in afterlife realms, all right? So... I do too. Yeah. You know, it's just really difficult at times to to find your harmon- harmonious alignment because <clears throat> sometimes I have so much trouble letting go of historical issues and you know my my personal historic issues mm-hmm. and. The forgiveness. <laughs> I, the for- I, I can laugh because I'm Walt Christos, right? And, right. And that seems to be like a fairly personal historic issue. <laughs> <laughs> You're too funny. <laughs> but the textbook is meant to help people like you. It is. I mean, I'm biased. I wrote it, okay? But I'm going to be dead soon, and the book will still be around to help people like you, okay? Well, I'm and reading them. Give the nuts and bolts. It's serious reading. It's not light and fluffy, okay? No, it's not. That's why it's called The Thought of Christos. And it's all there. And I, the first part of the book is like a a jigsaw puzzle being thrown on a table and all you see is all these different pieces, all right? And I basically just fly through a thousand things, okay? And then the next part is focused chapters, okay? 
And they start taking the pieces from the table and they make a little picture here in this corner because those pieces fit together there. And then I grab some more pieces and I put them together over here. And then I start combining that group of pieces with this group of pieces. And eventually, by the time you get to the end, you've got a total picture of it. Right? That's one reason why I, I recommend that people read it in order from front to back. Yes. But a lot of people do want to jump around. And they're not going to get as much benefit because each following chapter is built upon what has been explained in the previous chapters. Okay? And I tried to anticipate that some people would want to focus on certain things. And so I did try to give complete understanding of a topic within a chapter. But it is much easier if you read it through the order and get it bit by bit and let it sink in little bit by little bit. Because there's a lot of uh, serious thought in there. It's a serious book. It's not... It's not even small. <laughs> you know, it's a textbook. Right? But yes. I, call it a, I call it a textbook for its first 20 years, I guess. And then I started calling it a, a grimoire. Yeah. Because a grimoire is experience and research, personal experience and research. And this book definitely has a mix of that. One of the Funny things in the book is a just a quick little ditty in it where I'm I had to take my godmother Helene to the Miami airport and Hurricane Floyd was approaching and she was going to Brazil and the idea was she wanted to get to that airport and on that plane before the airport was shut down by the approach of the storm when winds got to a a certain uh, level, right? right. And it was approaching from south, going north. And so she got in the car, and we're driving down on I-95, and I looked around, and I said to her, gee, look, there's no traffic at all. We won't, you know, we should have no trouble getting to the airport. And she looked at me, and she said, you know, only a fool would be driving right now. And I looked at her and I said, well, you're in the car, too. <laughs> <laughs> you're right here. <laughs> I said, you're here, too. <laughs> so that made two fools. That is and too we funny. drove it, what, 60 miles an hour, headed straight for that storm. And that storm had been building for a week and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And I dropped her off at the airport, and that storm dissolved. <laughs> we hit it at 60 miles an hour. I didn't have a chance. <laughs> there you go. That is too funny. Oh, but, but it's a, maybe a once-in-a-lifetime kind of a, a thing, but you should have seen the newspaper reports. There were some that showed the whole state of Florida moving out of the way. They said, there's no way that this is going to miss us. And then they, so they just moved the state, right? <laughs> so it's a meteorological mystery, this storm that took, you know, it was so great and terrible. All of a sudden, I mean, literally, it dissolved. <laughs> With no scientific explanation for it. you got to love sure that, right? There would be a scientific rationalization for it later but that's one of the little bits of personal experience that's thrown into uh, the thought of Christos well we have um, Sherry again was just like she's impressed and interested in the Iroquois shamanism and so all of the things that we said. Well, I'm glad for her. <laughs> well, I mean, she's fascinated by it, and she's like, "How does he? Yeah, you know, how does he use that gift?" And I'm like, "Well, we'll ask." All right. There's, 
there are two different paths. Oh, wait, before we do combine. that, we have to take a before we do that, we have to take a break. We are so late. We'll be right back. I'm sorry. Okay. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. All right, very good. For me, uh, Iroquois and Shaman were two threads that are interwoven, but they are perhaps separate threads. I I was taught Iroquois ways, but I learned other Native American ways. For me, my predilection was dancing. Uh, I mean, it it allows me to touch energy yes. and to move and to feel. I mean, some people might drum, some people might uh, chant, and whatever works for them is is fine. For me, I was able to touch what Crowley would call energized enthusiasm through dancing and that is there's a you just feel the energy but there is also a reverence that is native american or among some native americans because people are people as individuals but there's a reverence for the land yes and i laugh when i hear people say this is a sacred american indian mountain and this is a sacred lake, and this is a burial ground, blah, blah, blah. And I laugh because all places are sacred. All places are burial grounds. All right? You have a reverence for the planet and living things as living things. Right. And not only as living things, but as spirit okay and so as a shaman I can be one with that now there's you could say there could be a genetic disposition which allows for some of that and that for a connection to occur there should be an overlap based on a similarity to build a bridge. I mean, there are a lot of different factors. But for me, from the Iroquois, I got the dancing and the reverence. And uh, on the shamanism, I was drafted as a traditional shaman used to be. A Christian priest is a human representative, can be self-chosen, goes through a learning process, but is a representative of humanity to other. An other, in a Christian context, is viewed as divine, be they angels or God. A shaman traditionally is drafted or chosen by other and is a representative of other to humanity. Okay? Yes. So when people of a tribe wished to communicate to other, they might go to a shaman to do it because that shaman was selected as a representative or ambassador 
by other. And in a shaman's view, other is other life form and can be, have a measure of divinity, just as humans can have a measure of divinity. But it's not, a Christian might seem to perhaps be saying that God is divine and humans are not. A shaman sees everything as perhaps potentially having a measure of divinity because to a shaman, divinity is spirit. Now, if you, I'm very eclectic, very eclectic, and I've tried to bridge many, many different belief systems. Many people believe in mind or spirit or mind or soul. I believe in mind, spirit, soul, and over soul. To me, mind is the essence of this lifetime, the you that is now at the cutting edge of the present and tends to see life from a physical or material perspective, lives in this universe, right? Yes. Spirit, to me, is the essence of all of one's past lifetimes. Spirit is a midpoint between soul, which never touches this physical reality, and mind, which lives within this physical reality. So spirit, the essence, the you of all your lifetimes, can touch both soul and mind, and in a way can be a communicator between the two if you look at it as a body part, right? the human metaphysical body. To me, soul is the largest part of you that is individually you. And each soul can be a cell, like a cell of a body, of a larger body. And that larger body is called an oversoul. There can be an oversoul for all men. So there that would be, be like a collective? Soul. Yes. Each soul being one cell in that body. And it's part of how we can connect when I, as a shaman, I can connect with the earth because I am connecting with what some call Gaia or the oversoul of earth to which all other spirits or souls are cells of this. So I am a part of the body of Gaia. I am not separate from this planet. It's not a raw resource. I am an extension of it. I am one with it. And that is the shaman's perspective, or even a magician's perspective, but it is part of what allows me my connection with weather, because that, too, is part of my belief, my automatic. So that is how my will flows, and because I know it, it works. I have a question. Right. I'm trying. To... Mm-hmm. Okay. As as a human, as a person, I'm. I am not. <clears throat> I am not a shaman. Okay. I am Cherokee mm-hmm. and Porch Creek, but I am not a shaman. So. 
Mm-hmm. But I am connected with Earth with a very mm-hmm. strong connection and creatures, Earth and creatures, which I think is just part of mm-hmm. the same thing. So you can. I can communicate with animals. Yes, yeah, you can. You can do it either through uh, your own animal lives, if you've had any, or through the earth. The earth becomes your midpoint. Well, they In just other words, know me. Let's say you can't connect with. Let's say you can't connect with a bird direct, right? <laughs> but the bird connects with the earth, and you connect with the earth. So you can connect through the earth to the bird. So that's how the communication works? Yeah, that's one of the ways. Because primarily it's... It's the same thing with psychics and healing and covens. In that, let's say that you have the genetics uh, one, two, and three. And the person next to you has got uh, seven, eight, and nine, right? It, it, the, the question is, why do some go to Lords and some get healed and others do not? So you've got one, two, three, and this other person's got seven, eight, nine. But let's say you add another person who's got one, four, and seven. That person can connect with the one person with the seven and with the other person with the one. So when they are all together, all three can connect. Though without the medium in between, the other two could not connect with each other. So it's the same thing with the the bird, the earth, and the human. Okay, Some humans might have the genetic predisposition to be able to connect with the bird if the bird has the right thing. But someone else might just connect with the earth and then through the earth to the bird. As a shaman, if I I have an affinity for certain animals, you just feel it. I don't, don't necessarily know why, but you do. But you don't have the same affinity that another person might have who might also have an affinity for some animals, right? And uh, that's how the connections are made. And that's how they can flow uh, in groups of humans. When you bring a group of people together, you are more likely to get those connections that some people could not necessarily connect with each other, but you get enough people together and then the whole group interconnects. Well, what if it's just you? How do how do animals recognize people that do these things? Maybe you, it's a psychic connection or a spirit to spirit connection. I would One go with spirit to spirit. I, was, I don't think I'm a psychic. Uh, but yeah, it, I mean, it, I don't know. But that's I, why I just thought my. I describe myself as a spiritualist and a psychic. Mm-hmm. And I do differentiate between that which is done with spirit and that which is done with mind. Okay. I don't don't necessarily uh, try to ever say apples are better than pears. And I just, I seek to promote a holistic, harmonious alignment of self and well, in general. Well, things just show up sometimes. Yep. My mm-hmm. my son has been known to come by the house and we have hummingbirds that if I filled up their feeder, they come up and they just, you know, hang out with me. They just fly around. And if it needs filling, it's a whole different kind of flight, <laughs> right? Their emotions are so much different. And my son looked at me and was like, good heavens, what is this freaking Disney World up here? What are you doing to these birds? I'm like, I'm not doing anything to these birds. They just appreciate 
when they get food and they're angry when it's empty. So they just like to hang out. Well, a shaman or you or anyone, but if you have a predilection that gives you a connection with a bird, the way it's put is from one bird to another. So that if you talk to a bird in Alabama, all right, that bird in Alabama can communicate psychically with a bird in Virginia, and that bird in Virginia can get a telepathic message to me. Really? The way it used to be, yeah, the way it used to be said was they used lizards. And it's from one lizard to another, to another, back to a human. Huh. From human to lizard, to lizard, to lizard, to human. And it's a part of a joke about the dog telegram. Oh. <laughs> well, that, I was just thought that was far hard there's, there's a message being passed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was just curious because when you were talking about that, I was like, hey, wait a minute. This sounds really familiar, but it's not, you know, I can do it with some people, too, but definitely, definitely animals. And it's. So that, that's what I was saying about there having to be a, an overlap. Yes. And that's why some go to woods and get healed. It's not just a matter of uh, belief faith, doubt, and disbelief, but it's also a matter of uh, connections, similarities. Yes. Well, you, you can you can connect on your similarities and grow on your differences. Connect on your similarities and what on your differences? Grow. Yes. Expand. I'm writing notes. You should see my note page. I always take notes during an interview. And that being said, we are going to take our final break. We have questions in chat that we're going to need to address when we come back. But y'all come back because this is the coolest stuff, right? You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham. Alabama. Abnormal Alabama presents Crypticon October 25th and 26th at the Board of the Wharf, Orange Beach. Bigfoot, the paranormal, authors and speakers, vendors, and your chance to experience the Psychomantium. There'll be a costume contest and much, much more. October 25th and 26th at the Board of the Wharf, Orange Beach. Get more info, directions, and tickets available now at AbnormalAlabama.com. That's AbnormalAlabama.com. <laughs> How about this? For some real information that you can use. Instead of the other um, sources, stay here where you are on WBHM, DB, Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio for our final segment with Walt Christos. And I'm telling you that you really need to go and check him out on Amazon.com. The books are amazing. There is a screenplay, The Rapture of Christos. There are, there's so many options. Just go into Amazon.com 
and search Walt J U A L T Christos C H R I S T O S. You'll see it in the banners, and you'll love it. Thoughts of Christ the thought of Christos is what I am working on, but there are so many. You will really, really enjoy the effort. And Walt, well, thank you for being here, and thanks for coming back and not running down the road after that last segment. <laughs> Teasing. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> the thought of Christos is a serious book. It does yes. require some thought and study. I like to think it's it's enjoyable, but my other books are easier, lighter reading. Uh, but the thought of Christos is a, like a crowning achievement to me, and it's it's meant to help people learn to cope in positive ways with internal and external negativity. It gives you the nuts and bolts of human dynamics, of how things work, of cause and effect, and gives you understanding and awareness and tools, but it's up to you to use the tools and to make yourself a better person. But this will help you to do it in life. Thank you. I think it's um, I think it's just right. It's a good, healthy balance. But are you ready for a couple of questions? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, Sherry is just full of questions for you, so, so hopefully she well, will. Thank you, Sherry. She thinks you're fascinating. She wants to know: Do you ever have premonitions about the future? Like maybe you saw something on the news and you already knew it had happened. <laughs> and I know what I have because I, I did read that. I have. I'm just going to answer yes and not say what they are. Okay. I look at I look at premonitions or divination or cards as showing a future that is likely to occur if present trends are continued. And that means that a dire prediction can be a warning and you can perhaps change the outcome. Okay? Yes. A lot of people say, oh, I see this, it's going to happen, I saw it, I know it's coming. But what you've been, and that can like reflect their desire to be correct. Yes. But what they've been actually given is a warning. It's like, I see a fire. Okay? So let's say that what you do then is you take steps to prevent the fire, and then the fire might not occur, or maybe you're ready to fight it, so the damage from it is less. Like if you see the person that sees the plane crashing, who then does not get on the plane. Right? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I've had some premonitions, but I seek to work for a golden age. I am not as optimistic as I used to be, and I have become more neutral in my vote and will rest content that humanity might get what it deserves. <laughs> that is a loaded that statement. Is yeah, and that is proper. There is still hope for a golden age. There is. Through free will choice to build a heaven on earth. Okay? Yes. But it has to be conscious choices. And I am not... For a golden age. Yes. For a golden age, it has to be. I say there are four paths that humanity... It travels on simultaneously. One is uh, 
Let's say one is Armageddon. And that is the end of civilization through abuse of free will. That humanity on its own chooses to destroy itself. Kaboom. Right? Yeah. Then there is 1984, like Orwell. And that is management and survival of civilization through limitations on free will and through managed conflicts. Then there's apocalypse. An apocalypse is destruction of civilization through mismanagement or natural disasters, which can also be mismanagement. And then there's the golden age where we seek to build a better world as a goal. And right now we are very big on cage building and in government we trust and we will know better than others and we will impose on our will on people for the public good. Right. And I am not in favor of that, but I prefer that to Armageddon. And yes, I prefer it to I 1984 also. I say that judgment is any time period when humanity has the means to destroy its own civilization so that Prior to the nuclear age, we were not in a time of judgment, but we were warned that judgment could be coming. And now we are. But because humanity is expanding into other realms, be that other dimensions, other times, or outer space, we are moving into neighborhoods that are already inhabited. And those who live in those places have some right to be concerned about us. And though I might not fully agree I can see where they might act to reduce our civilization. And that's a whole other thing of, you know, things I interact with either as a shaman or Christos from ETs to angels to gods to interdimensional beings to a little bit of everyone, human potential futures, the human, I mean, uh, yeah. I guess I went pretty far afield on that. I think it was a pretty great answer because I had to find places to squeeze those notes into, you know, the moving into neighborhoods that are already inhabited does not always mm-hmm. bode well for the new neighbors when they are not respectful of other people's place. So that's no. the only thing that concerns me really with that, you know, because as a when species, they, when you see humans killing each other over their nostril size. Yeah. Or I mean, over exactly. A of, over a piece of desert. <laughs> right. I mean, like I want to, I want to go and fight and die because I want to own worthless desert. I mean, give me a break, right? I agree. That's more like this is a designated war zone as part of 1984. But, I mean, no. We are not really respectable, decent creatures in the, we give a lot of lip service to we a do. lot of good false flag waving. But as 
my energies are based on positive karma and good dharma. And humans just don't really walk the walk. They talk the talk sometimes. Not always. Some will tell you it's a bad world, so you got to be worse. And, you know, it's a big mixed bag out there, but I, among my allies who have helped me with weather, have to have been many different groups, okay, including some ETs. And my allies have literally moved heaven and earth in my behalf. And humans have not cared. <laughs> and, and this does not look good for humans as far as the way they are viewed by my allies. I would... I don't think my yes. allies would have invested all this effort that they have done in my behalf if you think they are done when I am done. When I started, I thought that there was a foregone conclusion of some doom and that I was buying more time for humanity. And that could just be a very fanciful delusion. But if it is accurate, then there might be some sort of a next phase after my life is over. Scary to think about insane. sometimes, right? Yeah. Because we're not even good stewards of what we have, much less what we would try to go Some and aggressively of us are. take. That's the thing. Some, Some are, of us yes. Are. That's the thing but I collectively, try to remind myself. Yeah, there are every those. now and then I see real examples of human decency. Sure. I mean, I've gotten really tired of having to look. Uh, as fictional TV to find decency or at yes. at least movies about good people who have done good things. That is helpful. But as far as what I often see in my life and things around is none of that. And it's so disappointing. I just don't see the, the decent, de decency. I see cold people. I have sheltered and helped maybe a hundred people or so at least. Right? And these are, they, I have saved lives, all right? And these people really do turn their backs on me, okay? And I can accept that. <laughs> I can. But it's not a good reflection upon them. But that is how they are. It's just tough. It is very tough. But you know what? We've got a minute and 15 seconds. And I'm going to give you a question. And I'm going to say, this can just be yes or no if you want to. Sherry, again, says, have you ever had paranormal experiences or ghostly visitors wanting your help or just to talk to you? Yes. Thank were they positive you know. experiences? <laughs> I'm going to say, were they positive experiences? Yes. I have okay. only had one paranormal experience ever that scared me, made me feel threatened. I met an ET once, little guy, green guy, maybe a Zeta. And he said, I felt some fear. And I got an idea that that was just from facing an unknown. But it didn't feel threatened. Right. But, but there was a, an experience with a shadow that was darker than the darkness that I felt was going to leap up on me from behind me. <laughs> and I did feel that was kind of threatening because... I've had other shadows type beings that have been helpful or okay, but this one seemed to be wishing contact by surprise, and I usually felt contact by surprise 
is not a good thing. <laughs> they, I agree. The uh, world around threw energy into its center. And that seemed to push it back, and then I, I literally left the building where I was and went to a nearby friend's, figuring our two wills together would keep it out. Right. And it did. He thought he saw it outside. Oh. But it could not enter. Whereas maybe if there were lights on where I was, I was playing a piano in total darkness, which I used to love to do, and it was what I called the songbird in darkness. I made a little recording. <laughs> I was doing that, and uh, I just sensed it behind me. I could, like, feel the density. You know, and I wanted to dismiss it and keep focusing on music, right? But it just kept getting closer. <laughs> just a little bit too much, right? And I had a dream. I had had a dream where this exact sort of similar thing was occurring, except it was, in the dream, it was more of like an animal with claw. It oh. was going to jump on me, I guess, from back left. And uh, in the dream, I whirled around and dived into the center of it uh, and woke up. And so when it started happening again in real life, uh, you know, there was an apparition once that used to, I think I called him Hiram, and he was around me for a while. And I lived in a fraternity house in a second floor, there were about four or five people in my room, and I could see Hiram outside. And he was silhouetted in midair, and you could see him through my window. And the people with me, I was able to point out this shadow silhouette floating in midair outside my window. And I was on the second floor, and there was nothing out there on the ground. You know, no way that this thing, it was floating, <laughs> okay, outside the window. So I've had a lot of little experiences. I've had friends who have passed on, and I have felt their spirits commune with me in my home for a number of hours as a, a parting. And I have had some friends visit more than once. And I've gone to the other side, maybe, and visited a friend in his home there. I've had dreams of going to places. And I had gone to some of these places more than once. So I have interacted with spirits or non-physical humans and had good experiences and only had the one that was at all, that I felt threatened at all. Well, that is awesome a long minute <laughs> it was a long minute but you know what i have i have enjoyed every minute of this conversation with you thank you so much thank but you. i still have a lot of questions so we're going to have to do this again at some point when you feel ready for it you'll just have to let I me know when to. you're ready all right so and that being said everyone that's listening thank you so much if you're listening to a download or your own iTunes or iHeart or Google Play or wherever you're listening, thank you so much because shows like this are awesome and I am so glad that you're getting to enjoy it too. Y'all are the reason we do all this work and 
I will see you. I will be live with Paranormal Experienced on Wednesday with Barry Gaunt. That's going to be amazing. I will be in Orange Beach, Alabama, presenting at the Crypticon over the weekend. So everybody for Friday is going to be in rerun. I will be traveling. So from Sunday on will be reruns. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but they're great shows. I promise you great shows. And when I get back, we're down until February. So not down. We'll be, I'll be down. We'll be doing things live uh, from then through February at least. So thank you again. I will talk to y'all soon. Same cat time, same cat channel. And soon again with Walt Christos. Thank you again, Walt. Good night and thank you.